Christian's attitude towards self. Uh, and so we have been slowly, if you, if you recognize, starting with a very wide view, Christian's attitude towards sin, Christian's attitude towards uh, temptation, Christian's attitude towards Satan, Christian's attitude towards this present world, and the Christian's attitudes. Now we've come back to ourself. And so, uh, for the majority of uh, the rest of this series, we're going to be talking about, or at least the first half of this book, we're going to be talking about personal issues, things about ourselves, things that affect us. And so, these are really good application lessons. We're going to be getting into time. We're going to be getting in as far as our, uh, towards uh, secular work, towards money towards recreation, towards our government, uh, towards capital punishment, all of those types of things where uh, we have these things affect us. And oftentimes we don't discuss these things in lessons. And so it is good from time to time to actually examine, okay, what does the Bible say about this? And so in this lesson, we're going to be looking at what our attitude towards ourselves should be. Christianity is a primarily an individual religion. We often think of in terms of the church, and it is. We do have a, uh, like as far as groups, uh, local groups, but we're not going to be saved as the East End Church of Christ. We're going to be saved individually. And so uh, Christianity elevates and exalts the individual. Therefore, there is great responsibility that is placed on the individual. It's important that we recognize that because I am going to be saved personally or lost personally, there is responsibility upon me. These facts being true, we are not amazed when much is stated in the scriptures regarding what we have to do with ourselves. You, you can find that in the book of Ephesians. A lot of Jesus' teachings talk about personal, uh, how to behave, person, love your neighbor as yourself. That's not a, that's not a, a instruction given to government. That's not an instruction given to the church. It's an instruction given <clears throat> personally to people. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery. All of those are directed at people, individual people. And so, one will not do the proper thing if your attitude is not right towards yourself. Uh, the definition of what we're going to be talking about for self is an individual considered as an identical person, having an identity, having a personality, and being in its relationship to its identity. Sometimes we use the word identical meaning the same. This time, this is an older book and an older definition. Identical means having an identity. Uh, and so an individual considered as an identical person, uh, something that is unique. I am not the same as Gord or Kala or anyone else here. Uh, I, am, I have my own identity. I act like me. Gord acts like him. He doesn't act like me. Uh, and none of you act like me, and I don't act like you. We recognize we are separate. We have our own personalities. And so we often think of ourselves very highly. We, we, have, we, we're te we teach people to have high self-esteem, uh, not to get so down on themselves, not because that can lead to depression. Uh, when when you get when you get really low on yourselves, the Bible teaches something slightly different. The Bible doesn't teach us that we should get our take ourselves to be so high that we elevate ourselves too high. And in fact, the Christian should regard, in some respects, 
yourself as your greatest enemy. And we're going to discuss why that is. Uh, because we should regard ourselves as a greater enemy than Satan and this world, for we have to cooperate with Satan if we are going to sin. We have to cooperate with the, the people of this world if we sin. Satan can't force me to sin, and neither can anyone else in this world. I have to be in agreement. So, in some sense, ourself, we need to regard as a greater enemy to ourselves than Satan. Let's go to James chapter 4. We'll get Gord. I'll start instead of starting with Tammy. I'll start with Gord. James chapter 4, verse 7. And Kelly can get 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. James 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Who has to submit? Us. Us. Personally. <clears throat> therefore, submit to God. Resist. Who has to resist? Us. Us. Personally. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, we have an obligation to submit and resist. What happens when we don't submit and resist? Well, we're with the devil. Yeah. We're following. We're not for God, we're for the devil. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's pretty clear. If we don't resist the devil, that means we're on the devil's side, doing what he is tempting us to do. But we've made that decision. The devil didn't make it for me. There was, a, 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 there was a, an actor and back in the, I think it was the 1960s, uh, and, or, or as a person in the 1960s, I, I don't, I, I never knew him, but my dad did, and he, oh, there, his catchphrase was, the devil made me do it. No, the devil didn't make us do anything. We chose. We have to submit. We have to resist. If we don't submit to God, we submit it to the devil. If we don't resist the devil, he won't flee from us. He'll stay and be our friend even though he's not our friend. Uh, he'll pretend to be our friend. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stood up the room. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, all faith. All right. Who is born of God? Who is born of God? Christians. Christians are born of God. What does verse 4 say? Who is born of God? Is he who was? For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. In other words, we have victory. Our faith leads us out of the world. Are we saved on a church-by-church -church basis? No, we're not. He, for whoever is born of God, overcomes the world. And our faith is what allows us to overcome the world. It's an individual thing. And therefore, if we don't do this, we only have ourselves to blame. So we can be a greater enemy to ourselves than Satan can. We still have to watch out for Satan. We still have to watch out for the, the, this, this world. We've had lessons on that. But it's us who have to watch. We can be a bigger enemy to ourselves than Satan. And that's because self... Ourself is the only one or only thing that can separate the Christian from God. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. It's a longer reading. We'll do two verses each. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. I'm going to allow everyone to get there. So Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. We're going to start with Tammy. We'll go back to Lisa and... 
to Annette and then to Henry. We're going to do two verses each, 31 through 39. We'll start right. with Henry. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he, not with him, also freely give us all things? What shall we What shall we against God's government? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is living at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? 39. 35, 35 and 36. 35. Yeah. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? Continues further, further down. For your... For your sake we shall we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor power nor pain present present, no thing to come, no things to come, no height or depth, no will, no any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. There are the classes. Um, so, a lot of people read this section. And come along. If God is for us, who can be against us? What's, who's the an what's the answer to that question? Nobody can be against us. That's an outward nobody. Nobody can be against us. If God's for me, Gord, if Gord's against me, doesn't matter. God's for me. If God's for uh, Tim, doesn't matter if I'm not for Tim. God's for Tim, nobody can be against Tim. In other words, Tim's not going to be affected by what I do. However, we can take that a step too far and think that that someone includes us, includes ourselves. Notice Paul, uh, what Paul is saying here. The reason that it doesn't matter what someone else thinks it matters what God thinks is because God is the one who justifies people. Christ is the one who died and has been raised from the dead. Christ is the one who makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Tribulation can't do that. Distress can't do that. Persecution and famine and nakedness, peril and, and sword, meaning death, that can't do it. Thing, principalities, uh, nor powers, things present, things to come, death, life, height, death, none of that can separate us from the love of God. But that doesn't mean we can't separate ourselves from the love of God. How, how do we know that that is true? How do we know that's true? We don't act according to his will. Yeah. If we don't act according to the will of God, we were once outside the will of God. We were out, we were not Christians. If we come along and say, What shall separate us from the love of God? and say, Well, that means I can do whatever I want, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that once we have been saved. That is it. We can do whatever we want. And even though people who claim to believe that doctrine will vow and declare, know that that is not what happens, 
That's exactly what they're saying, though. If God saved me at some point in time and I can never be lost, I don't see why I would have to live as a Christian. I just don't. I don't see why I would. But moreover, let's go to John chapter 10. Come back to Andre. John chapter 10, verses 27 to 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give eternal life to them. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. All right. Who are Christ's sheep? Sorry, but, but in, this specific, uh, in this specific passage, Christians are right. Okay. <laughs> disciples. What's well, verse 27? My sheep what? Hear his voice. And? and they, follow. they follow. So, the Christ's sheep hear Christ's voice and follow him. Verse 29, or verse 28 says, No one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. No one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. In other words, the devil can't take them away from me, and neither can you or anybody else. Christ, uh, Christ uh, is able to save us. That's what this passage is saying. This should give us comfort. Christ is able to save us. But, verse 27 still, still says, My sheep hear my voice and follow me. If we don't follow Christ, we're not his sheep. We can walk away. We can walk away from Christ. And if we can walk away from Christ, Christ didn't lose us. We allowed ourselves to be lost. The devil didn't cause Christ to lose us. We were the ones who sinned. So ourselves are the only thing that can separate us from Christ. And that's why these verses in John 10 and Romans 8 should be a comfort to us to recognize, okay, the only thing that can separate me from Christ is if I go off into sin. I don't have to worry about anyone else. If I go off into sin, that's the only thing that's going to keep me from Christ. The factor that so many people fail to recognize is the power of self. And they never see it as an enemy. And that makes it more powerful and far more deadly than other enemies. It is in the fifth column that must be defeated. We had, we had uh, sin, temptation, uh, we, uh, um, Satan, present world. Now we have self. We, we have to give up our self. And so the Christian's attitude towards self is one of proper evaluation. Many never see themselves as they are. They see themselves as they want to be, or as they think they are, or as others see them. We, we get a lot of self-worth by what others think. In the social media age, now some may not, many may not be on social media, and that's probably a blessing to you. But uh, for in the social media age, people put up a post and uh, online. And they want to see how many likes they get. And people get a lot of self-worth from what other people think. It has nothing to do with whether or not that actual thing was worthwhile or whether that actual thing was right or wrong. They want to get a reaction from other people. This is our society today. Always caring about what others think. But that we, we put on a mask for other people. I don't know how any one of you lives when I'm not there. You could be great Christians or very poor Christians. But you could come on Sunday and put on the show that you're a good Christian. And the same goes for you to me. You don't know. You, 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 you make some assumptions based on maybe how... Uh, how we present ourselves, but we all have a mask. We all have things that we do not reveal to others. 
The problem is when we keep that mask on for ourselves, we don't evaluate our lives and we don't fix the things that need fixed. We've just covered it up and we hope it will go away. And so the Bible teaches us that we are not to think too highly of ourselves. It doesn't mean we have to think of ourselves as some something absolutely hideous. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with having confidence. But we have to be careful. There is a fine line between confidence and arrogance. Uh, that there is that fine line where we, we think of ourselves too highly. The uh, I'm not trying to get into politics, but this, this is an example of what that means. The current president of the United States got up four years ago and he told the nation that they, he need, they needed to elect him because he was the only person in the United States that could fix all their problems. That's a problem. When we think of ourselves so highly that we think that we're indispensable. If, if I go away, if I die, then what's this church going to do? Well, hopefully, go on. Uh, the, 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 uh, that's, that's the thing. It doesn't have to just be the preacher. It could be any member. Well, I do this and I do that for the church. If I'm not there, then... This church is going to fall apart. I hope not. I hope the strength of this church can withstand someone leaving. We don't want anyone to leave. That's not what I'm getting at. But all of us should be pulling our own weight, and none of us are so important that uh, the church would fall without us. You could think of the New Testament characters. Stephen. Was Stephen a, a, a mighty preacher? Yeah, he was. He was a very mighty preacher. Acts 6 and 7 would tell us that. Stephen died. Did the church go on? Yeah. And it grew, actually. It grew very mightily after Stephen's death. Persecution happened, yes. But the church grew. The apostle Peter, was he a mighty preacher? Yeah, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter eventually died. And the church went on. Peter's, the, the, the lessons that Peter taught lived on because it was Christ. The message was Christ, not Peter. And the church moved on, not moved on, went on. And the same goes for any Christian throughout <clears throat> all of history. Everyone dies. Everyone moves someplace else. Hopefully people don't fall away from Christ, but that happens too. We are not indispensable, and we should not think of ourselves so highly that we become arrogant and think that I'm the reason this church is here. I'm the reason that they're doing so well. That's a problem. Let's get some verses on this. Let's go to uh, Sharice, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Henry, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. And Cherry, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 17. Romans chapter 12. Verse 3. 13. No, it is verse 3. Sorry. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, <coughs> in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Does this passage teach that we should not view ourselves with any worth? In other words, that we should think ourselves as worthless. Gord shaking his head, no, why not? Well, we are worth something because Christ died for us. Okay. We have worth. We do have worth. So in other words, we do not have to walk around with the woe is me attitude, with sackcloth and ashes all the time, in the worst clothing, uh, not really caring about ourselves. That's not what this verse is saying. This verse says they ought not to think himself more highly than he ought, but think soberly <clears throat> with open eyes. Gord. We're meant to be a humble people. Yes. That, 
We are to be humble. That, that, that's true. That's how high we should think of ourselves. We should put others before us. We should put God before us too. But we should put others before us. There is a certain attitude that we are to have and we're not to think too highly of ourselves because if we think too highly of ourselves, that's where arrogance and pride comes in. And those are problems. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. <clears throat> pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. This probably is one of the uh, misquote, one of the misquoted verses in the Bible. Because it, it, it's not teaching something that's wrong, but it's just misquoted. The saying often is, pride goes before the fall. That's not what the verse says. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Again, the, the saying, pride goes before the fall, that it, it's saying people who get too proud, too full of themselves, typically <clears throat> find out that they have mistakes too that they make. And when you're arrogant and you're proud, people tend not to give you a lot of grace when you fall, and they actually enjoy it when you actually uh, make some mistakes or go off and do something that you shouldn't. They're glad because of how arrogant and full of yourself that you were. Whereas if you are humble, if you do, if you do recognize that you do have flaws and you give grace to others and try to help them through their troubles when you fall people won't be glad that you fall, fell they'll try to help you get back up and they'll, they will show you grace Proverbs chapter 25 verse um, uh, 17 Could you, read, uh, could you read that again? I didn't I didn't catch that. It wasn't your fault. 17? Yes, 17. Proverbs 25, verse 17. Mm -hmm. uh, 17. Alright, what, what's that verse saying? Seldom set your foot in your neighbor's house, lest he become weary of you and hate you. What, what, what's Solomon saying there? Don't go over and visit people? Oh, and don't overstay your welcome, too. <laughs> don't overstay your welcome. Mind your own business sometimes. Don't, 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 always, don't always go try to fix things that don't need fixing. Your neighbor's going to become weary. They're going to be tired of you. They're not going to listen to you. They're going to hate you for it. So uh, a lot of people, that sometimes they mean well. I'm not saying people always mean bad. Sometimes they mean well, but you didn't need the help. They think of themselves, well, I've got to, I've got to step in and fix it. Parents can do that with their children sometimes. Instead of allowing their children in a safe way, I'm not talking about if there's a danger, but in a safe way to make some mistakes, but they try to go in and fix it all the time, their children aren't going to learn anything. Well, people, if they think themselves too highly and think, well, I know the right way to do it, and so I'm going to help you, I'm going to force you to go. We got to, yes, if, if we see someone who's going to go off into sin, Telling them, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. That's a warning. If we do that humbly, that's not wrong. But we shouldn't go out and just be the corrector looking for faults in people. And some people do that. They just out there, they're out there looking for faults. They, they've got, I have in, I joke in about uh, my condo, uh, some of the people who live in my condo and the other two condos that are there. I feel like they're walking around with the rule book, looking for things that people do wrong. Uh, if you've never if you've never seen the condo rules for my condo, it's amazing. It's a thick it's a book thicker than this of how of all the rules that you're to do and whether it's in 
the, the rec center or whether it's in just the common halls or whether it's in your condo itself. And I feel like some, uh, uh, some of the strangest things, I'm like, wow, I never knew that was a rule. I didn't think that, sh uh, that doesn't bug me. But there are people out there who, who are like that. They, they, they think of themselves, well, I'm, they, they take on themselves a job that they aren't qualified to do. We need to be careful that we do not think too highly of ourselves. We should know and prove and reprove ourselves. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. We'll come up to Annie. Galatians chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. For individuals so far in hand, do you think that they are fancy? They be saved of, uh, themselves. All mass the past is their own work. Then that work, trying to the neighbor's work, will become a cause to fall flat. Yeah, th this, is, this is a warning to us. If anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he is deceiving them, himself. So in other words, again, we think too highly of ourselves. We think we're strong in an area when we're actually not. We're deceiving ourselves. We need to examine our own work. That, that's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> judge not that you be not judged. For with what manner you judge, you shall be judged. It's not teaching, don't judge. Jesus that first, though, tells people to look at themselves. Take the beam that's out of your own eye before you go and try to take the speck out of someone else's eye. If, if you have something, if you, if you poke your eye with something and have something hanging out of your eye, I know that's disgusting to think about, but if you do, and then I go over to Andre. Andre, you have something in your eye. <laughs> and Andre's going to take a look at this thing and be like, you have something in your eye that's much bigger than the thing in my eye. How are you going to get that out of my eye? I first need to take care of myself. And that, that's Paul's teaching that. Examine your own work. It does not mean that if something, if so, if something your neighbor is doing is wrong, that Christians are just to let them be wrong. But we need to remember, we start with ourselves. We should know what we're doing and correct what we're doing. And not always look outward first, look inward first. Know and prove ourselves. Because in the end, we might have fixed everything that our neighbor has wrong with them, and they get to go to heaven. But if we've not followed Christ, we won't. And so, yes, they get to go to heaven, that's great. But we won't enjoy it, because we won't be there. We need to know and prove what our, uh, prove ourselves. We must do this constantly. Let's come up to Tim, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse five. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. As you said, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? All right. Now, Paul's writing to who in this book? The Corinthian brethren. I'm glad you attached that. Paul's a Christian. The Corinthians are Christians. What did he tell them to do? <clears throat> Examine themselves with why. See if they're in the faith. See if they're serving God. Now, if I'm always saved, why would I need to do that? I wouldn't. But Paul, at the end of this verse... So Christ Jesus is in you unless what? Unless you fail the test, unless you're disqualified. If Christ Jesus is not in us, can we be saved? No. Christ Jesus needs to be in us. And again, I'm not talking some mystical or magical thing. The Holy Spirit needs to be in us. God the Father needs to be in us. 
If God is for us, who can be against us? If Christ isn't in us, we're not going to heaven. And Paul's telling these Christians here, examine your faith. I, 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 would, I would make this almost a daily thing where you need to examine, okay, what have I done? Beginning of the day, end of the day, what have I done? What are the things that I have done right today? What are the things I have done wrong today? So tomorrow I don't go and do the same things. If you never take a look at what is, what is if you never take a look at your life, you don't know what might need fixing. And so this needs to be constant. It should not be a monthly thing or a yearly thing. We can do that. It should be a daily thing. People ask, how much, how many times should I ask for forgiveness of my sins? I say, why are you not asking? We should be always asking. Sometimes we'll know we've sinned. Sometimes we won't. We should pray that God would reveal to us the ways that we have sinned so that we know not to do that again. But we always should be asking for the forgiveness of sins because we know that we do sin. And so that should be our attitude, a constant examination of ourselves. I am not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to declare.